What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? You work too hard to get to the end of your life and have nothing to show for it. This is my family's legacy that I'm talking about here. I've got to have a plan and be focused. That knowledge that you pass down to your kids, that is how you change a family tree. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you have that moment where you say, I've had it. I'm not going to live like this anymore. Go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 this morning. Also, real quick here, a quick plug for Financial Peace University. You'll find it inside your worship folder, the details about this. Uh, it's a great program. It's a great class. It helps you get a handle on your finances, whether you're single, a couple, you're old, or you're young. It's a great way. They talk about things like how to get out of debt. They talk about establishing a budget, where you should be investing. So if your finances are kind of a point of stress for you uh, this new year, or you just want to get a better handle on it, uh, you want to feel more peace about it, I want to encourage you to you can go online and sign up for that. Or if you don't like doing that, you can give our office a call uh, and they will get you all signed up for the Thursday night class coming up. Well, also inside your worship folder is a, a blue sheet. Those are blue notes to help you stay connected. Or if you got a smartphone here at Hope, we actually encourage you to pull out your smartphones, use them during the service, go to the U version, Y O U version, and click on a tab that says events, and boom, all the notes will come up and help you stay connected and help you follow along. So we're in a series uh, we started this new year calling The Way We Worship. And last week, I kind of kicked it off at our annual blessing service with just kind of an honest assessment of where my heart's been at, and an honest assessment of where I see, you know, many of our hearts. So as I look at my life and your life, as I look at even people in the community that I care about, that I love, uh, here's what I have come to. It's a very stark reality, and even from a pastor, for myself to admit this, in front of you is that we, we very simply do not see our need for God. At myself, the church, community, we, we don't see our need for God. And, and like I said last week, I'm not trying to, to beat us up with that statement. I'm not trying to just to, to use strong words to, you know, to, to shame you, to think, to get you to think about it. For me, I, it's just an honest, simple assessment of where my heart's at. It's, it's an honest prayer for me and for our church. It says, God, we really are not connecting with you. We really don't see our need for you. Why does that feel so hard? And, and, I, and I came up with some conclusions around this, and they're not real deep. They're not real deep theologically or philosophically. But, but first of all, I just came up with a conclusion that we're human. And in our humanity, we, we very often tend to go with what's natural. We tend to go with, hey, you know, <laughs> I'd rather grill a steak today than read my Bible. We also deal with a, a culture, a, a world that is constantly pulling us toward things. And, and yeah, some of them are temptations, but we, we get constantly pulled toward distractions because some of them are good. But they distract us from God. And whether they're our comforts or our recreations or we pour our time into our work or even our families, we get so busy with the good stuff of life. That we forget about God. I mean, am, I, am I right with that? Is that true in your life? Because it is in mine. We don't make time for him. And, and that led me to, to simply my third conclusion was that we, we just don't see our need to connect with God in worship. So, so check yourself with that. If, if, if you think about your worship of God, and when I say worship, I'm not just talking about Sunday morning worship. I'm saying anytime you seek after God, you, you go after Him, you want to connect with Him, how much of that is all about you and not about God at all? God, we want you to fix this with my life. I need you to do this. I need you to change this because I want to get back to this good life that I've constructed. So I need you to bring me back to that. And that's as far as it goes. And we see this, we catch a glimpse of this, is what Solomon, the preacher here in Ecclesiastes, 
is getting at in chapter 5, verse 1. Look with me. As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. It's evil to make mindless offerings to God. Don't make rash promises. In other words, stop bargaining with God. And don't be hasty in bringing matters before him. Like, God, you have to do this for me. After all, God is in heaven, and you are here on earth, so let your words be few. So as we counter God in personal or congregational or private worship, we often put ourselves in the opposite place of this verse. We often put ourselves up in heaven and God on earth, and we say, God, you need to do this for me, so God, why aren't you serving me? And, and what's more is if we don't need anything, then we're not even connecting with him at all. Now, now, now when I say this, I, I want us to honestly wrestle with that. When I look at the reality of what worship is for us, in whatever category you want to use, church, prayer, Bible reading, your life group, serving in the church somewhere, bargaining with God when you drive down the road, whatever that is, I want us to do an honest assessment and just <laughs> admit, I think most of it is about me. And there's not a whole lot of it, God, about you. Because do you feel the tension with that? Do you feel the disconnect with that? Because we know, we know, God, yes, you are in heaven. You are king. You are ruler. I am on earth. I know that. But for my mind and my heart and my life to live that out on an everyday basis and to practice that, do I, do you live with that conviction? I want you to see and hear something in this series. And, and, and you see a theme all throughout the Old Testament. It's in, all your, it's in the entire Bible. And, and you see it as a theme through all the New Testament. You see it as a, as a theme, even if you were to study the early church, the people of God who practice the worship of God, where God is in heaven and we are on earth, the people, the people of God that practice that in their very minds, in their very hearts, with all of themselves, as they worship God, they find the most fulfillment and the most satisfying thing in life, and that's God himself. And for some of us, we hear that, and that is just a disconnect to us. God, really? You are the most satisfying thing because every time I seek you, I just don't feel anything. It feels like you're far away. It feels like you're non-existent. I have a hard time connecting as, as we talk about the things of you. But the reality of the truth that we find in the Old Testament and the New Testament, all of church history, is you and I were created for one major thing, and that's to worship God. And certainly, God gives us all these things that we can enjoy. He does. But we're not to find our satisfaction, our full satisfaction in all of that. Sure, we, we're, we're, we catch glimpses of satisfaction, enough for us to want more and more and more and more, but they never completely satisfy us. It's only when we can jump into the worship of God and the worship of Him that we're satisfied. So here's what I know. I just simply want to grow in that. I, I just don't want to live out my life with these little compartments of God that, that I pull out once in a while when, when, when I pray before a meal or that, that I pull out once in a while when I, when I need something or that I, I come to church because it's this religious thing to do and it's kind of my bargaining with God. God, if I go to church, then you're going to bless me. And ah. I want my heart to grow in worship where that becomes the highlight of my day. Well, when we all gather, it's the highlight of my week. That's the upward goal, all right? That, that's just the reality I, I, I'd like to get to. But let's, uh, let's get back to the tension. Let's get back to what I really see in my life. I'm distracted from that. There's something that just completely distracts me. I don't know if, if you can agree with this, but John Orberg writes, my capacity, whether I'm worshiping or I'm praying or I'm reading my Bible, my capacity for mindlessness is staggering. How many can say amen to that? Boy, the first service was far more mindless than you. 
My capacity for mindlessness is staggering. I like Henry Nouwen's description of my head. When I'm trying to pray, when I'm trying to worship, it's like my mind is full of a tree of monkeys. I go, yes, amen, that's a great, this one's screaming, that one's screaming, this one's playing, I'm just, ah, I'm just distracted. I try to read my Bible, and there's that smartphone that's always calling me for the latest news, the latest score. Someone, you know, sharing some recipe. Somebody's doing this, doing that. My friend is sending me a pic on Snapchat, whatever. They're commenting on my post. I know, I know, I know, Sunday morning worship, it's what I want to do, but hey, I got my nephew's birthday party, my kid's basketball game, and you know what? There are only so many warm, sunny days in Wisconsin. I don't want to spend it in church. Yes, that's what we think. Don't worry if you're nodding yes, the usher's not going to come and slap you on the head. If your wife's whacking you on the head, that's none of my business. I think in in, in pieces of that, we can all say, yes, John, you're right. On one hand, I know I want to, something, I've, I've touched it, something in my life says, yes, I want to worship God, and then I'm distracted. I'm being pulled away. There's this tension. So let me just share with you from Scripture what I see the tension and what it's really all about. And I'm admitting to you that this is what it's all about. At least it relates to me. You can see if it relates to you. The tension around the worship of God. Remember, not just Sunday morning worship, but my seeking earnestly after God. The tension around the worship of God comes from a divided heart. A divided heart. James, the brother of Jesus, leader of the early church. The early church struggled with it. Why wouldn't we? He writes this. If you're seeking God, if you need God for wisdom, you ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, make sure your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person, here it is, with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and is tossed by the wind. Does that describe your life? Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Here's what I hope for you if you've been a Christian for a while. I hope that that verse, you don't shy away from a verse like that. I hope there's some honesty that goes in your heart. I hope there's something that connects with that and says, hmm, you know what, James is right. That is absolutely true about my life. My loyalty is divided. It is. Between God and the world. My love for God and the love that I have for all the things that distract. And so so to me, it's very simple. We love our distractions. But but where does that lead? If, If you were just to go after these distractions in your life, where is it going to lead? What does James say? It will lead to an instability in your life. So much so that you'll be tossed around just like the waves in the ocean. Just in the waves of the sea. I'm going to be up one day. I'm going to be down the next day. My circumstances are going to bump me here. I'm going to have trouble in my relationships. I'm going to have trouble in my parenting, in my marriage. I'm going to be tossed back and forth with what I think is right, with what I think is wrong. I am going to be just unstable. Why? Because you can't love two things. You can't. And so when I thought of that, what what is this loving two things? What is this dividing? Did you ever know, and I know none of you ever did this when you were in high school or college, but but you ever heard of, maybe it was your friend that did it that was trying to date two girls at the same time? Did you ever know of anyone like that? Some of you are smiling, oh, that was me. No. Is that person stable or not when they try to do that? If once the girls find out, it's not a wave, it's a tsunami that hits them, right? And here's something else I don't understand, and I know, and, and, and I'm not trying to heap a bunch of guilt on you. Well, yes, I am actually about this one. I know some of you are into The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, all right? All right, that's reality. Is that a stable show? It's not a stable show. It's some guy or some girl trying to date 12 different people. They are unstable in all their ways. That's why they're filming it. Because instability is fun to watch. And all the drama of it. I don't want to live like that. I don't want to have two different loves. 
I don't want to have that lack of focus and direction. I get tired of being tossed and round. So I, I'm just willing to admit this morning, I hope you are too, that's the reality of my divided heart. This John Ortberg, who is a well-known author and speaker, and by the book, uh, by the way, a, a book around this, one of the best books, if not the best book uh, that I've read about staying focused in life. It's called The Life You've Always Wanted by John Ortberg. He writes this, the capacity of the human heart for duplicity, having a divided heart, the capacity of the human heart for dupl duplicity is staggering. Human beings have a remarkable capacity of self-deception. He writes, the alternative to duplicity is a life characterized by simplicity. There's an unbelievable relief that comes in being delivered from double-mindedness, in finally deciding and making decisions on the focus of your life. Think about it. When you go out with someone who, you know, someone who's kind of double-minded at a restaurant, ordering something at a restaurant is a nightmare for them, right? It's torture. He goes into it saying, you know, a super salad, right? <gasps> Potatoes or rice, coffee or tea, cash or credit. Are you kidding me? I don't know. Some of you wrestle with even the words double-mindedness. Some of you can't make up your mind right now if you have double-mindedness or not. That's what he writes. Yet Jesus talks a lot about it, and it can kind of be summed up with one thing, can it? When Jesus said, seek first, what? God's kingdom. Seek God first. And all these other good things, all these other distractions, they'll, they'll get added to you when you're, when you're seeking him first. So if you and I want to be saved from this divided life, we really want to say, yes, God, I want to worship you because I know, I know, there's something in me that says I am most deeply satisfied in you and you alone. The answer to that is to do something with the monkeys that are in the trees. All right? We need to have our minds renewed. And as Ortberg writes, the indispensable practice of having our minds renewed is the practice of spending time in God's Word, in spending time in the Bible. And you might be saying, oh, okay, Pastor John, I know, here's another message again about reading your Bibles. Okay, I want us to understand that if our desire is to find satisfaction in God and our desire is to worship God more, we have got to understand the indispensable practice of spending time in God's Word. Of actually, as Solomon said, letting my words be few so that when I come into the worship of God, I'm not doing all the talking, but rather I'm doing the listening because I want God to speak to me. I want God to change my life. So let's ask the question, how does this worship through God's word? Because if I do that, as I worship him, as my mind is renewed, how will that bring stability in my life? I want us to be honest about that so we can actually go at it from an honest perspective. Here's the answer. We find it in a familiar verse, and I just want to unpack this a little differently this morning. But Romans chapter 12, it's in your notes. It's going to be on the screen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, so in light of everything that Jesus has done for you, offer your bodies, and bodies is not just your physical bodies. It is all of yourself. Offer yourself to God. Say, God, here I am. It's all of me. It's a pleasing sacrifice to you. That is true and proper worship. So, God, I'm offering all that I can. And here's how I do that. Here is how I offer myself to you. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. So that's one side. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ah, that's the other side. I need to have my mind renewed. Then I'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. I, I want that, what's good. I want that. I want what's pleasing, yes. And I want what's perfect in my life. So for all that what God has done for me, how do I stay singular focused? How do I get the monkeys off the trees and stay focused on you? So here's how I picture this. When you and I say yes to Jesus, all right, when we say, yes, okay, Jesus, I want to believe in you. I believe what you've done for me. Jesus then pulls us onto this path of a perfect, of uh, his will, it's perfect will that's good and pleasing and perfect. It's this path he puts us on. And, and, and I picture this path uh, kind of like the paths we have around here that were once railroad tracks, right? Those raised paths they put the railroads on. And since then, they, they pulled all the tracks off, and they cover it with gravel. And it's this raised path, and it's smooth. 
And you can walk down it. You can bring your kids on it. You can bike on it. You can enjoy the path. But you step off the path because it's kind of high, and instantly you're into the muck, right? It's muddy. It's murky. You can look out from the path. You can see the woods, and, and you could trip over the logs. If you continue off the path, there might be a cliff. There might be a swamp you have to go to onto. So for you, in the sake of your family, the sake of your kids, you stay on the path. And every once in a while, you know, you see something shiny, <laughs> it's there in the marsh, and you take a few steps and, to check it out, and all of a sudden you're, you're up to here in mud. Or all of a sudden you, you step off the path for a little bit, and, and you trip, and you wonder, why, am I, why is my head bleeding? And, and if you stay out there long enough, bumping around long enough, and you keep going, pretty soon you're lost. In other words, a life outside of the path is unstable. A life on the path of God's will leads to stability. So how does worship through God's word help me to stay on the path? Number one, worship through his word places me back on the path of what is true about life. All right, look at this. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The biggest threat that keeps us off the path, that takes us off the path, is we choose to believe something that's not true. We conform to a pattern that's not true, the pattern of the world. So let me just, as I thought about what in the world, how could I describe what the pattern of the world would be? All right, so let's just think of everything the world offers. So you turn on the TV and just think if you were to buy hook, line, and sinker into every commercial on television, all right, pattern of the world, you were to buy into that, what would happen? What would be true if you said, if I were to do that, here's what would be true in my life. First of all, you'd be eating nothing but fast food, right? If you say, oh, that's true, oh, I'm just pizza, burgers, whatever, that's what's true. Secondly, you'd be, if, the, if everything on TV was true, you'd be drinking a ton of beer, right? Beer all the time, right? Because, hey, that's the good life, right? You'd be buying a new car every few months. Oh, yeah, I need that car. Yeah, that's what I need. You'd be filling your, your house with all kinds of furniture. You'd be buying new carpeting every six months, new flooring everywhere. And then, <laughs> to deal with all of that, whether it's the financial stress or the health problems that come from all the fast food, because what else do you see on television? You'd be buying all kinds of medication to take care of your poor health. Right? Constantly, your terrible health. On top of that, if you go past the TV commercials and you, you know, start grabbing everything that comes on your screen time, you'd rack up more debt because of the latest deal on Amazon. You'd start flirting around with the personal ads because, hey, you're not quite satisfied with your marriage. After all, you, how much harm could be in just looking? So what's the reality if you were to do all that? Two wives later, three bypasses, an addiction to opioids, and at least one bankruptcy that's what would happen. That's what it would be, seriously, to conform to the patterns of the world. That is where you would end up. That's what's true. And all of us, granted I'm exaggerating for a reason, all of us can find ourselves somewhere in that. So we need to get back on the path. We need to hear a truth that's going to transform us. And God's word tells us what's true about life. Tells us what's true about himself. Tells us about the real outcomes that will happen because of our behavior. If you doubt me on that, just start reading the book of Proverbs. We're going through Ecclesiastes explaining the reality of life. So we all need this truth that will lead to change in our lives. We find it in God's word. I don't know about you, but this happens to me all the time. When I spend reading or I spend studying God's word, it's a constant reminder of, oh, uh, you know, have you ever been standing in a puddle and not knowing you're in a puddle until the water starts seeping in? That's what it's like to step off the path. You're off the path, you're doing something that's like, oh, you open God's word, oh, I'm off the path. I need to get back on again. I I'm reminded of what's true. Or, oh, wow, my forearm... <laughs> I just, I just whacked myself into that rock, and I didn't even know it. Ah, oh, I'm off the path. I'm bleeding. I, I got to get back on. It comes down to believing what's true and what's not. I need to replace the lies with what's true from God's word. So that's why here at Hope, our worship services here at Hope always include time around God's word. 
Our songs are, are based upon the truth of God's word. That's like in our life groups, we study, have studies that are based on the truth of God's word. That's why we encourage you every week, bring your own Bibles. See the truth for yourself. Spend time daily so you can be renewed daily. Because here's the deal. You and I are getting constantly, constantly, constantly bombarded by the things that are not true. Regards to our finances, our relationships, whatever we think is going to get us ahead in life. The world offers one way. Pursue it, pursue it, and it's going to lead to instability. God offers a different way, a stable way on his path. And sometimes I'm out there, I'm standing in a puddle, I don't even know it. I open God's word, ah, okay, i got to get back on the path. Number two, worship through God's word puts me back on the path. It actually pulls me, supernaturally pulls me back on the path of transformation. Here it is. And now I want you to see how this is linked together. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So as I discover what's true, as my mind engages with what's true, and I say, okay, God, that's true. I'm going to choose today believe, to believe that what you say is true. What happens is supernaturally we're changed. Our mind understands what's true, and we, our life begins to change, be transformed from the inside out. Pastor Todd talked on this a couple weeks ago. It transforms me. It changes me. And here's what I want you to know. You might say, okay, I need to hear God's word. Boy, my life needs to be changed. So I'm just going to open up this book, and I'm just going to start plowing through it. I'm going to read 10 chapters a day. I'm not talking. When, when, when we're talking here about truth that transforms, we're not just talking about Bible knowledge. I'm talking about allowing the truth of God's word to speak to the duplicity that exists in your mind. Because you can have a great understanding of the Bible, and you can have a ton of it even memorized. And maybe you win Bible trivia games, any question that gets asked, you just know it, you got it. I like what Ortberg says about this. Take any person you know, so think of somebody right now, take any person you know whose knowledge of the Bible is ten times greater than somebody who is unchurched. So think about that. Someone whose knowledge of the Bible is ten times greater than the average unchurched person. Then ask yourself if this person is ten times more loving, ten times more patient, ten times more joyful than the average unchurched person. Do you see my tension? Do you see the division I find in my heart? It's not just about Bible knowledge. That's our disconnect. Sometimes we just think, okay, I got to just do this religious thing. I got to just understand more of the facts, and that's all good stuff. But if it's not transforming our hearts and minds. So maybe instead of reading 10 chapters, maybe you should read 10 verses. And maybe the fact is you're reading 10 verses, 10 words jump out at you. Because it tells you, oh, you're standing off the trail, you're in the water, you're in the muck, you just tripped over a log, and those ten words speak some truth. You're like, oh, that's true. And maybe the next morning, instead of going to ten more verses, you stay on those ten words. And maybe every time you open up this Bible, you say, God, I want to know what's true about you, I want to know what's true about life, so show me, teach me. I'm going to be quiet now. I'm going to let my words be few. Because of the bombardment that we get, all of us do, because we're not to just go put our head in the sand. We, we get bombarded by a, a, to conform to a pattern that's different than God's pattern. We get bombarded with that all the time. Let me just tell you this. A few minutes on Sunday morning of what's true is not enough. We need to have something regular happening in our lives if we want to grow in it. Let me ask you, and you can raise your hands to this. Do you regularly spend, regularly spend time going to work? Wow, man, all of you got rest of you on welfare. I didn't know. Yes! All right, how many of you, and I will raise my hand, regularly spend time watching television? Yep, all right. How many of you are music lovers? You regularly listen to music. Yeah, I see you. You're driving down the road. You're singing to yourself. That's awesome. How many of you are regularly on social media? You're connecting with people on social media, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, whatever. 
In all of those things, and none of them are completely wrong, but in all of those things, you are getting bombarded with the conforming to the world. It's, it's just what happens. You pay attention to it long enough, you're going to get knocked off the path. And so you need more than a couple minutes on Sunday morning to get back on the path. We need regular time listening, reading, pondering what God has to say in his life. And it, it say to our lives. And don't worry, sometimes you read the Bible and you go, oh, I just don't get that. I was reading some passages out of John this week and I'm like, wow, that just, I don't understand that. That's okay. You don't have to get it all. <laughs> so for many of you, you just need to start. So start in the New Testament. Start reading, reading the stories of Jesus. And here's what you do as you say, God, you know, would you speak to me in that? Read a story of Jesus. And I don't know, I, when I watch a movie, and if it's a good movie, I find myself in the movie. You know, so much so if there's any disruption, I want to say, shh, quiet, because I'm in it. Put yourself in the story that you're reading. Imagine, what would it be like to, to be sitting there listening to Jesus? Imagine, what would you think when you just saw this miracle Jesus did? What, 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 where would you be? Put yourself in that story. Asking God to speak to you through that. Others of you, you know, you, you, you kind of done that. You need to jump into a book of the Bible that you've never really read before. So for many of you, that's the Old Testament. So here's what I encourage you, for you, if that's you. Get a good study Bible. Why is a good study Bible important? Because there's a big intro before you start reading the book that's going to tell you what's going on. It's going to tell you the history. It's going to give you the context. So that when you read that, you can say, oh, okay, that's what's going on. So then I can start applying that to my life. Inside your worship folder, go ahead and pull something out. Someone from the church sent this to me this week. I'm sending it to you, all right? It's a little green folder. It's a little calendar. Unfold it. Look at the calendar. Look at it. Starting tomorrow, January 15th, as we get into this study around the worship of God for who God is, this is a great idea when they sent it to me. This is a great idea for us to know more of who God is. Say, oh, I don't, know. I, don't, I don't know what to read. I don't know what to study. Here it is. January 15th. There's a, there's a name of God, there's a description, and at the bottom, here it is, there's a Bible verse you can go into and read. You can see that truth for yourself. You can say, God, how is this, how are you this, and how does that affect my life? And there's 30 days of it. So here's what I want us to do. For those who are struggling just getting in God's word, let's jump into this 30 names of God. 30 ways that God has revealed himself for us. And in this short description, in this Bible verse, let's just not go into this and say, oh, here's more Bible information. But let us go into it and say, God, I want to be on the path marked by what's true about you. So I want, I want you to reveal yourself and make yourself more real to me. And this is just one way. For those of you who are, who are actively reading, it's just one way to add to your time. For others, you can just start here to be present Here's what I know. When it comes to knowing about anybody else or anything in life, if you want to get ahead of your job, you have to know more about your job. If you want to get to know another person, you have to get to know that other person if you want to know more about them. If you want to be a better golfer, a better cook, these things take time. So it takes time being intentional. If you want the truth of God that's going to transform you and keep your life stable, we have to be intentional in jumping in. It doesn't just happen. You don't just say, okay, God, I want to know you more. Magically make it happen. That's not how it works. you got to seek him. That's what we're talking about, the way of worship. That leads me to number three. As we get put back on the stable path, number three, worship in God's word preserves me on a path of trust. Preserves me on the path of trust. Here's what happens here. So imagine now. Okay, I get put on this path, and on this path, I'm starting to realize, okay, God, what you say is true about my life. Wow, I'm starting to see that because my life is changing. And as I say, okay, that was wrong, but God, what you have to say is right, my life starts to change more and more. What happens? I begin to trust the one who said it. I begin to trust that what he says is true actually does bring change to me. So I'm going to want to seek more of what he it says it's true. And as more change happens, that's the more I trust. That's what Paul's getting at here. He says, look, then you'll be able to test. You'll be able to know and approve what God's will is. What is good, 
what is pleasing, what is perfect. Do you see? Do you want what God has as good for your life? Do you want to have what God has as pleasing for your life? Do you want to have what God is saying, no, this is perfect for your life? How many of you wouldn't want that? That grows from a renewed mind. That grows from a transformed life. And then I learned to trust. So here's how I imagine this. You know, how many of you have ever had your little kids on a path like I described? And you get on the path, and what are you doing the whole time? You're telling your kids, stay on the trail, stay on the trail, stay on the trail, because they want to run all over the place. Like I've told you this before, we went to the Grand Canyon, I'm freaking out, my kids don't want to stay on the trail. They go off that trail, you're not just standing in the mud, you count to ten, you're dead, right? That's what happens there. I was talking to a teacher this morning, she said, I know, field trips, how many of you teachers, field trips, you take these kids on field trips, they don't want to stay on the trail, they're running all over the place, but, but, if you say you're going to have a better experience, this field trip is going to go so much better for you if you stay on the trail, that's what's true, here's how I see it, as we embrace what's true, as our life is transformed, we stop running around. We stop looking to the edge. We stop going, oh, that's shiny over there. No, we just rest, and all of a sudden we put our hand out, and we say, Jesus, I want to walk on this trail with you. And we just hold Jesus' hand, and we say, oh, yep, you got this. And you know what? I, I may look over there, and Jesus kind of just gives me a slight tug and pulls me back. And it becomes a relationship, not a religion. His word is a relationship of trust. And the more I know him, the more I want to hold on his hand. Because so many times people think, oh, if I really start getting in this old-fashioned book called the Bible, it's, it, ah, it just feels old-fashioned. I'm not going to have any fun. It's going to take away all that. Jesus says, wait, hold my hand. Because you don't know what's around the corner. I know what's around the corner. And, and you might be trudging up this trail, and it's a hill, and it's hard, and, and, and it just you're like, oh, Jesus, Jesus, just, just trust, because we're going to get over the top of the hill, and I got, I got something i got to show you coming up. Because look, I want you to see a familiar verse here, okay? I want you to see what God's Word does for us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to do what? Keep us on the path, teach us what's true. It's going to help us realize what's going wrong in our life. Don't you want that? Corrects us when we're wrong. Says, oh, get back up here. Teaches us to do what right, what's right. And then some of us think, you know, I, I, I'm just studying the Bible so that I can get up. Ortberg says a perfect score of 100 when at this entrance exam getting into heaven. That's not what God's word is for. God's word is for because he's going to use it to prepare you and equip you to do every good work. That's what God's word's for. Because around the corner, there's a great work God has planned for you. Over the hill, there's even a better work that God has planned for you. God uses his word to teach you, to correct you, to put you back on the path. Because there's all kinds of good things that he has planned for your life. But you have to embrace what's true. You have to let that transform you. And you have to allow it to, to bring you into a place of trust. You're going to trust God with it. Every moment of our lives is an opportunity to do something good that God has planned. But you can't do what God has planned if you're over there playing in the mud or you're bumping your head against a rock or you've just fallen off a cliff. What would our lives look like if we were on God's path of truth and transformation? What mistakes would have been avoided? What anxieties would have been needless? How much more stable would our lives be? So do you see why worship's so important? Personal worship, private worship, worship them when we get together. We come together to say, hey, I know you've been bombarded this whole week with what's not true. Let's remind each other of what's true. Let's see our lives transformed. Let's learn to trust more so we can get on with the good things that God has for us. Let's pray. Almighty God, we are here this morning, and at least I am willing to admit I have a divided heart. There's tons of stuff that I love. There's tons of distractions that scream loudly at me. There's, there's monkeys in the tree. And God, that has led to instability in my life. I, I, I don't want that anymore. So God, I, I would pray that you help me pursue what's true. Help me see your word as, as a way I can worship you to listen, to stop talking, and hear what you would have for me. 
So God, I, I would pray that for all of us. I would pray that as a church, that coming together would be an exciting time because we just want to hear and remind and tell each other what's true. And God will let leave the changing to you, the transforming to you. We want to trust you. We want to walk hand in hand with you. We want you to be our single devotion. I want to invite the other